Taking time for your local farm news week in review here on AM 960 KLTF. This week in farm news, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture this week awarded Minnesota $8 million to increase the number of flex fuel pumps in the state. Minnesota is one of 21 states to receive grants through the USDA's Biofuel Infrastructure Partnership. The Department of Agriculture matched this federal support with funding and an in-kind contributions from a coalition including the Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council, the American Lung Association in Minnesota, the Minnesota Biofuels Association, Minnesota's ethanol plants, and participating service stations. These grants are good news for our state. This funding will help Minnesota install additional flex fuel pumps at gas stations statewide, as according to Lieutenant Governor Tina Smith. This is a win-win, providing consumers choice at the pump while supporting Minnesota farmers. In Minnesota, the USDA grant and matching contributions are projected to assist with the installation or retrofit of 620 pumps and related equipment. Grant funds are estimated to support up to 165 retailers in the state. We, are, we at the Department of Agriculture are humbled by the confidence the USDA has placed in us with this grant award. We look forward to managing this fund and to match contribution to achieve the best investments to expand ethanol fuel choice in the state, said Minnesota Agriculture Commissioner Dave Fredrickson. Nationally, the USDA grant is expected to more than double the number of stations that offer intermediary ethanol blends, such as E15, as a gasoline for vehicles 2001 and newer, and higher blends for flex fuel vehicles such as E30 and E85. Before the USDA grant funding, coalition investments in the past two years have resulted in more than 40 Minnesota stations installing about 120 flex pumps that dispense a combination of high ethanol blends for flex fuel vehicles and E15 gasoline as well as E10 regular gasoline. Minnesota is a national leader in ethanol fuels development with nearly 300 E85 retailers throughout the state. The U.S. Department of Agriculture announced this week that nearly one-half of the 1.7 million farms that signed up for either the Agricultural Risk Coverage, ARC, or Price Loss Coverage, PLC, programs will receive safety net payments for the 2014 crop year. The ARC PLC programs primarily allow producers to continue to produce for the market by making payments on a percentage of historical base production, limiting the impact on production decisions. Nationwide, 96% of soybean farms, 91% of corn farms, and 66% of wheat farms elected the ARC county coverage option, 91% of long grain rice and peanut farms, and 94% of medium grain rice farms elected the PLC option. Overall, 76% of participating farms are protected by ARC county, 23 are protected by the PLC, and 1% by the ARC individual. For data about other crops as well as state-by-state -state program re election results, the final PLC price and payment data and other program information, including frequently asked questions, you should visit fsa.usda.gov slash arc hyphen PLC. Crops received assistance including barley, corn, grain sorghum, lentils, oats, peanuts, dry peas, soybeans, and wheat. In the upcoming months, disbursements will be made for other crops after marketing year average prices are published by the USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service. Any disbursements to participants in ARC County or PLC for long and medium grain rice, except for temperate Jaholo rice, will occur in November. For remaining oil seeds and also chickpeas, that will be in December, and temporary Japonka rice in early February 2016. ARC individual payments will begin in November. Upland cotton is no longer a covered commodity. The Budget Control Act of 2011, which was passed by Congress, requires the USDA to reduce payments by 6.8%. For more information, producers are encouraged to visit their local Farm Service Agency office. To find a local Farm Service Agency office, visit offices.usda.gov. Minnesota farmers harvested almost one quarter of their corn acreage during the 53 days suitable for field work for the week that ended October 25th, this according to the USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service. Although this was the fewest days suitable for field work in four weeks, harvest continued to advance rapidly. In addition to harvesting, field activities for the week included fall tilling, cherishing, and applying manure. Rain during the week helped replenish topsoil moisture levels across most of the state, 
Topsoil moisture supplies were rated at 3% very short, 22% short, 73% adequate, and 2% surplus. Subsoil moisture supplies were rated at 4% very short, 19% short, 76% adequate, and 1% surplus. Corn harvest for grain was at 81% complete, 12 days ahead of the previous year, and almost a week of the five-year average. Corn moisture content at grain at harvest was at 16%. The soybean harvest was virtually complete over one week ahead of the average. 95% of the sunflower acreage has been harvested three weeks ahead of last year and almost three weeks ahead of the average. Pasture conditions rated 63% good to excellent, down slightly from the previous week. Some producers were moving cattle onto harvested cornfields. The leaders of the Senate Aid Committee said this week that they are close to agreement on legislation that would reauthorize child nutrition programs, providing some pertinence for higher school meal standards developed by the Obama administration. The School Nutrition Association, which represents local school meal programs, and the School Superintendents Association sent a joint letter to Congress on Monday appealing for more funding to cover the higher costs incurred because of the higher standards. The Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act, which was authorizing the administration to increase nutrition standards, expired on September 30th. Average corn and soybean budgets for cash-rented farmland will be unprofitable in 2014, this according to projections based on currently available input costs and market prices. To assist agricultural landowners, renters, agribusiness professionals, and others, the University of Minnesota Extension and its educators will be presenting 44 workshops throughout the state during November and December, a complete schedule for the What is a Fair Farmland Rental Agreement? The workshops is available at the University of Minnesota Extension's website. No registration is required. Rents are the major input costs for soybean farmers and corn, accounting for 44.5% and 28.5% respectively. Landlords with increasing property taxes increased rental rates during record prices. Now they are trying to play catch-up when budgets do not support current rental rates and other input costs. Lower rental rates in 2016 would help struggling farmer tenants, but lowering those rates may require some tough negotiations. A flexible rental agreement may be the best option for 2016. In this kind of agreement, both the landowner and farmer share the price risks. If prices improve, so does the rental payment. A flexible agreement can also factor in higher than average yields. During the workshops, the extension and its business management professionals will lead discussions about current farmland rental rates, land values, leasing agreements, and related financial issues for landowners, farmers, landlords, tenants, and agribusiness professionals. The presenters will provide examples and worksheets for both tenants and landlords covering the fair rent program, the flexible leases, and fair rental agreements. The Cropland Rental Rates for Minnesota Counties publication, which uses the FinBin database, is a helpful resource as well. Find resources and current trends in farmland rental rates and land economics at the University of Minnesota Extension's website at extension.umn.edu. As expected, a World Health Organization body on cancer research Monday has labeled red and processed meat consumption as potentially leading to colorectal, pancreatic, and prostate cancers. The official announcement came from the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer, this following reports in the British media late last week. The reports were confirmed Monday in an article in the Lancet Oncology, Red meat was classified as a Group 2A carcinogen based on evidence that it is probably carcinogenic to humans. For the purpose of the study, IARC considered red meat as all types of mammalian muscle meat, which includes beef, veal, pork, lamb, mutton, horse, and goat. Earlier this year, glossophate, a top herbicide in agriculture, was also placed in this category. According to the IARC, there are 75 agents in this category, which includes desinamin, an insecticide used in fruit production, and the occupation of being a hairdresser. Processed meats, however, fall into IARC's Group 1, its most stringent classification. Processed meats referred to any type of meat transformed through salting, curing, fermentation, smoking, or other processes that in, to enhance flavor or improve preservation, such as hot dogs, ham, sausages, and beef jerky. There are 118 in the Class 1 category, which also includes air pollution, gamma radiation, and smoking. 
And that concludes this week's local Farm News Week in Review here on AM960 KLTF. Farm News available online 24-7 at fallsradio.com. This is Farm Director Scott Colum saying thanks for listening.